Hi, hi. So let's do this last effort. Uh, I hope I'm okay because I prepared this yesterday night, but contrary to my custom, I drank. And so I don't know. I wrote something, but it seems a bit incoherent looking at it now. But in any case, so let's uh, uh, what uh, let, let's do a slight recap of what I was discussing yesterday. I was discussing about CLT, and the point is that I have a map. Okay, so uh, let's call it T, and this map uh, is a, a map which uh, is like I don't know, like C two for example, from uh, I don't know, like T D to D T. So the torus and is expanding. So the inverse contracts and, uh, uh, sorry. The inverse contracts. And uh, I, so we know that it has uh, a unique invariant measure, absolutely continuous with respect to the back. Uh, and we have an observable, uh, which uh, also, I don't know, maybe, uh, I think it must be C1 at least. And uh, it has the property that is zero average. If you remember, I started with the generic observable, but then I subtracted the average. And so you can always get to zero average. And what I am interested in is to study the Birkhoff sum Ah. I'm sorry. I want to study this Birkhoff sum, and the way I want to study it is I want to compute the characteristic function. So, first of all, I discovered that I better normalize, uh, I better study not this one, but rather Sn divided square root of n. This is seems to be the proper normalization. And uh, I want to study this. Uh, ah, sorry, and I forgot. You have that the initial distribution, the initial distribution yesterday, I took it to be some uh, initial measure, which is absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue with most density. But in fact, uh, you can start with uh, the equilibrium measure, which is H star. I mean, it, it's less general, but the computation is exactly the same. There are slightly simplifications. So uh, let's imagine that you start with that. And then it means that this is a random variable. Actually, this is a random variable because, uh, I mean, the initial point is random. And now you have this random variable and you want to understand what it looks like. So what does it mean? It means essentially that you are interested, you understand that a random variable if you are interested, uh, sorry, you are able to compute average of function of this random variable. So if this is a function, uh, then you look at any function of this random variable. Oh, sorry, I have to normalize it. And, uh, and then uh, you want to know what the average is. And that is more, if you know that, then essentially you know the random variable because a uh, random variable, you measure average of function of the random variable. That's more or less all that there is to know. Uh, and this is equivalent to knowing the, the, the distribution of the random variable. Okay, if you want to know the distribution, just take A to be the, the interval zero X and that uh, the characteristic function of an interval. And this will tell you the probability that the random variable has a value in the support of the characteristic function. But uh, I mean, just to simplify things, let me assume that A is smooth, is CR. And then if A is CR, you can expand it in Fourier series. And if you can expand it in Fourier series, then you can write this as, uh, sorry, A hat of lambda. So this is the Fourier transform. And then 
you have the expectation of e to the i lambda over square root of n s n. And so it means that if you know the characteristic functions, then you are able to compute any average of any reasonable function. And of course, the people here uh, that are uh, mathematically, especially mathematically incli inclined, they will notice that I use Fubini theorem to exchange the order of the integrals. Okay, fine. And now, uh, so, in that, so that is the quantity that I was going to study very well. And what did I do? Well, what I did was to notice that I can define a transfer operator lambda uh, that applied to a function h, it is uh, equal to the usual transfer operator that is associated to the measure, uh, uh, the SRB measure, the measure absolutely continuous with respect to the bag. Uh, and, but it has a factor here. Uh, and then that, okay. So instead of uh, having the usual transfer operator, you take first the function, you multiply it by this complex weight, and then you uh, apply the transfer operator. And if you introduce this object, then there is this uh, uh, in very nice formula due to uh, go uh, to, sorry, to uh, uh, Nagayev and, and Givarsh, and this tells you that this, you can write it as L lambda over square root of N, yeah, which is this parameter here, to the power N, and then this is applied to H star. Okay, so that is the, four, that the initial measure. That this time, just for commode, for simplicity, I assume to be H star. Okay, so this operator here, you can check with the, the same technique that we use to check. I mean, this operator here, you can see that is analytic in lambda. I mean, yes, that's this kind of very easy to check. So this uh, uh, set means, uh, and since uh, the eigen, maximal eigenvalue at zero is uh, simple and uh, there is a spectral gap, this will persist. So there exists a lambda naught bigger than zero, such that uh, this thing here, let me call this thing phi n of lambda, the characteristic function, phi n of, uh, uh, no, this is always analytic, but uh, uh, such that uh, uh, L uh, uh, lambda is uh, uh, equal to some new lambda, and then uh, here there is, uh, uh, so if I apply it to H, here there is a rank one operator, which is uh, some function H lambda, and then there is an element of the dual, and then there is order of uh, uh, beta, uh, so let's say N, this is N, and beta N, and beta N is strictly smaller than new, than the inf of the new lambda for each lambda, the smaller lambda. So that is the situation. So this term here is exponentially small, so it doesn't do much. And the main term is this guy, okay? And so if you understand what, uh, so it means that phi lambda, phi n lambda is equal to uh, uh, new lambda. And so, and also this is, I normalized that in such a way I can normalize this thing in such a way that this is equal to uh, uh, one. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is a row less than one, right? So this is smaller, so this is not n. This is, it is smaller than the smallest of the eigenvalue because it goes to zero faster, right? Why do you want a soup? Yes, I want it to work for all of them, yes. But I mean, it's in some interval up to lambda naught, so it's in a compact set. So if it is smaller than everyone, I mean, it would be 
Uh, I, I mean, that is what I mean. This guy here moves from one, right? And uh, this guy is the essential spec. I mean, it's uh, the second eigenvalue. So the second eigenvalue, if it exists, moves, maybe up. The other one moved down, and for a while it will always be smaller than the other. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so it looks like this essential, and then there will be maybe a correction because these apply to H star is not necessary. It's not necessary uh, one, but since you normalize this, but the mistake will be uh, at most of order. Well, you can compute it, but is of order one over square root of lambda, uh, lambda over square root of n, something like that, okay? And, um, and then uh, you have plus order beta n, okay? So that's more or less what uh, the story is gonna be. Uh, actually, I'm not sure. I think that if you start with H star, this is not even there. I am not sure. Well, I don't yeah i don't know well that doesn't matter i mean what okay, let's let's uh, this is a i think this is a rough estimate so you can do i think you can do better but and uh, and so what you need to know sorry to the end what you need to know is what is lambda so that's where i was yesterday and uh, uh so sorry this is over square root of n because this one is for lambda, but uh, I apply it to lambda over square root of n. So there is a square root of n there. And uh, what uh, I saw yesterday is that if you take the derivative of lambda for lambda equals zero, then this is zero. And uh, the second derivative must be positive. And this, I call it uh, sigma square. Since it is positive, I can call it sigma square. Uh, it is uh, some something, I don't know what. And uh, and so this is going to be equal to, uh, uh, as, and of course, uh, sorry, I didn't try it. Lambda zero is one, because that corresponds to the uh, eigenvalue of the transfer operator without any weight. And so this is going to be equal to one minus, uh, sorry, it's, it's negative. Uh, minus and this negative sorry uh, one minus uh, uh, lambda square over uh, sigma square over n because i am applying it to lambda over n plus order of lambda cube over n to the three half to power n okay and then there is some correction one plus order lambda over square root of n plus order of beta to the n. Okay, so this one, you recognize this is a limit that uh, we have done in calculus one, long, and for me, a very long time ago, uh, but I still remember somewhat that it should be e to the lambda minus lambda square. Oh, there is a two here, it's Taylor. So uh, that plus order of lambda cube over square root of n. And then one plus lambda over square root of n, order, and then plus order beta to the n. So, so you see, this one is the characteristic function of a Gaussian. Okay, so that means that uh, uh, this integral here is equal to e lambda. And then here I have uh, uh, e i minus sigma square lambda square over two. And then there are some mistakes, which is essential of order of, uh, okay, so it will be lambda, uh, lambda over square root of n, right? That's more or less the mistake that I have. Uh, but lambda over square root of n, since this function here is, uh, is a CR, that is essentially bounded by the derivative divided by square root of n. Okay. It's just the, the Fourier transform, lambda times the Fourier transform gives you the, it's just the derivative. 
uh, and the norm of the derivative. So, okay, that's more or less what you get. So this mistake is of order one over square root of n, and this guy here uh, is uh, something, uh, but uh, you have to be careful, right? Because this, it works, this works only if lambda is smaller lambda, so this works for, uh, let me write it here, for lambda smaller than lambda naught time square root of n, right? Because lambda over square root of n should be smaller than lambda naught, okay? So that means that that is okay from minus lambda naught uh, square root of n to lambda naught square root of n outside this interval, this approximation won't work. But outside this interval, this guy is smaller than one. And so you are just integrating this function outside this interval. And if the function is smooth enough, then the tail in Fourier transform is very small. And so again, you get some of this order uh, or even smaller. So, Uh, if sigma square is zero, what is the problem? I mean, uh, still uh, the, the, the Fourier transform decays. I, I, cho I choose uh, A. Yeah, I mean, if the Fourier transform is zero, then uh, uh, this term here will simply be uh, A computed, uh, what is it? A computed in zero, right? Because it means that the random variable is more or less concentrated at zero. That if, if sigma is zero, then it's still a CLT, but it's a bizarre CLT because it just says that the random variable is zero uh, with probability one. So I mean, just you are in zero. So still, I mean, it means that if you do this estimate, then you get A computed at zero because this guy is small. And so that's what, what you are computing. Yeah. And that is exactly what this formula says. Okay. So the point is that since this one decay, here you can put in minus infinity and infinity. And the mistake that you do is order of, uh, uh, so the mistake that you do, it is of order. Let's put, uh, it is the integral from, for example, square root of n to infinity of a hat. This uh, is more or less uh, the integral of the square root of n to infinity of 1 over uh, lambda to power r, where uh, uh, r is the smoothness of the, of the function. And then uh, this gets uh, to be uh, n to the r minus r plus 1 over 2. So if r is... Uh, 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 large enough, uh, this is, will be smaller than this mistake. So I just consume that R is large, and that's it. Okay, so that's nice. Uh, but there is this issue. So uh, what does it mean? It means that uh, you can, uh, uh, so the conclusion here is that this average, which is the object I'm interested in, is given by going back to Fourier transform is a of x e to the minus, uh, sorry, the re, yeah, uh, lambda square over sigma square. Maybe there is a two, I don't remember. This is this formula, I can never remember this. Now, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, there is a two, and uh, uh, sorry, this is x. Uh, in, in uh, dx, and then there is a normalization, which is square root two pi uh, sigma, okay? So it means that you want to compute plus order of a c, maybe cr, something, because square root of n. I'm not uh, very precise of what r is, this kind of, I mean, it's just ideas here, so. Uh, you can compute it by yourself, just making this argument precise. And now, that means that, what does it mean? It means that this guy is distributed according to a Gaussian. 
of variance sigma. So that is what is called the CLT. But of course, there is the objection of uh, Roberto, which says, OK, what about if sigma is 0? That is a little bit bizarre. Can you tell me something? And, and anyhow, what is sigma? Because if I want to make uh, some experiment, then I have to. I want to know what is sigma because I mean uh, the Gaussian can be very spread, very concentrated. So it would be very nice to have a formula for sigma. And so what do I have to do to get a formula for sigma? Well, it is written here. I should do perturbation theory to second order. So this is rather you can do. It's rather boring. I won't do it. Let's do something slightly different. I just say, but wait a second. After all, the function that I am interested in is this one, OK? And if I look at the second derivative of this function, this is exactly sigma square, right? Because if I look at the second derivative, this function is this guy here. I take the derivative twice. I compute it in 0. I get exactly sigma square. So why don't I take the derivative of this function twice? And that's it, well, rather than doing perturbation theory. Because perturbation theory tells me, tells me that that is the formula. So this, I get it from all this Ambaradam. I get that sigma square is equal to the derivative with respect to lambda twice of the expectation of e to the i lambda over square root of n Sn. OK, and computed for lambda equals 0. So I, I can do two derivatives. That's, is, I can uh, safely do that. And you can see that you get minus, and then you get the expectation of Sn square over n. OK, that is what it is. Yeah, I mean, okay, fine. Then, then you have to take the limit, right? In the limit is like that. So, this is yes, uh, yes, 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 yes. But, but, but it's the limit of this thing, right? Yeah. Ah, these mathematicians. Okay, right. Okay, so uh, that's what I have to compute. Okay, let's compute it. Let's compute it. So maybe uh, I can erase something over here and do this computation. Yeah? Ah, sorry, sorry, it's minus sigma square. Yes, yes, yes. Oh my God. I told you that I drank too much yesterday. There. Yeah, because sigma square is not the derivative is the minus the, the second derivative. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so let's compute the expectation of S and square. Okay, so this is what it is. It is the sum from K and J that goes from zero to N minus one of the expectation of P compose T K P compose T J. And now you have to break up this sum into two parts. The part in which K is equal to J. So let's write it here. This is the sum from K that goes to zero to N minus one of the expectation and then if k is equal to j, you get phi square, and then you get phi square composed tk. But uh, I am doing the computation with respect to the invariant measure. So it is just the expectation of uh, phi square, because it's invariant. So if I compute it now or I compute it at time tk, is exactly the same. And then I have the other term. For the other term, what do I do? I mean, there are. Uh, the case in which k is bigger than j and the case in which k is smaller than j, but they are exactly symmetric. So I can just write twice one of them. And then I have the sum 
for k bigger than j going from one to n minus one. And then I have the expectation of phi composed tk, phi composed tj. But now I can use the invariance. And instead of writing this, I can write this minus j. And there we are. And so it's just a correlation between these two terms. And now, of course, it's very tempting to choose k minus j equal to L and uh, do a change of variable in this sum. Now, this, uh, now I'm doing really serious mathematics. I don't know, this is just uh, this serious stuff. Computing sum, changing variable. That is really, I hope you are impressed. Uh, so what is going to be is going to be L that goes from uh, one up to n minus one, I guess. And then, then I have the expectation of phi composed TL phi. And then I have the other sum. The other sum, uh, uh, so let's see. If I fix L, then for example, K is equal to L plus J. So, uh, J can go from zero, so K will start from L and can go till N minus one. So I would say that you have, they are all the same, these terms. So you have N minus L term, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe N minus L plus one, I mean, you know, whatever, so it doesn't matter. Okay, so you get this nice formula here. And of course, as uh, you can see, these are all the same. So you have N of them. And so let me write this formula upstairs here. Uh, so I get N, the expectation of phi square plus twice the first term gives me the correlation. I mean, there is always the, yeah, yeah. Then I remember I have to take the limit for n, I have to divide by n and take the limit for n going to infinity, right? So uh, that is okay. Uh, and then I have that term over there. Okay, so now what I want to do here, it says that I have to divide by n and take the limit for n going to infinity, okay? So if I do that, you can see what is going to happen. This disappears, okay? This term, this, so you get this quantity and then this part here, you see this is convergent because the correlation decay exponentially so this quantity here goes exponentially to zero, but is multiplied by L. So L by E is something exponential. This is finite, but then you divide by N and it gets to zero. So it means that the limit is exactly this quantity here. Let's put it in square bracket. This is sigma square. So that is the formula that I, see, I think Caroline wrote already in some lectures ago. It's just the correlation, uh, and, and this is a quantity that is positive. Although, you know, if you, if you compute, uh, if you would have computed the second, uh, per the perturbation theory to second order of the leading eigenvalue, you would have gotten exactly this formula. But the drawback doing that is that from this formula, it's not obvious that it's a positive quantity. Because you look at it, and uh, you don't know what these correlations are. Why is that positive? You don't know. But uh, now you know that it's positive because you see where we started. We started from the expectation of SN square. Uh, that is positive for sure. So uh, that has some advantage computing in this way. You get extra information. Okay. Fine. So what does it mean? So now finally that I did this computation, I identified 
what is uh, sigma square. I know how to compute the variance. Well, to, it's not such an easy thing to compute this correlation, but still, you can try to compute it if you want. And now I can address the question of Roberto. What about if sigma is equal zero? What happens if sigma is equal zero? Well, if sigma is equal zero, it happens that this part will go to zero, right? Because this tends to sigma. So in the limit, this will go to zero. And so le let me just write it in a slightly different way. I write this up to infinity, okay? And then I subtract what I added. So it's exactly the formula as before, but now I will put exactly the sigma square here. And, and this is the mistake. And if sigma square is there is zero, it means that this term is not there anymore. Okay, so that term is not there. And now I look at this and I look at this and I say, but wait a second, this stuff is bounded, this stuff is bounded because this is exponentially small, right? This goes to zero. You sum it from n to infinity, you get something exponentially small. Time n is exponentially small. So this is actually small, this is bounded. So what does it mean? It means that this is Sn square. So Sn square is bounded uniformly in n. So it means that Sn is something in L2 uniformly bounded. Ah, now you open your book, I don't know, like my preferred is the same and you discover that then it is weakly compact. Okay, so that means that there are convergent subsequences of SN, weakly. What does this mean? It means that, let me see if you need something. Uh, let me think one second, what do I need? So what I can erase. Um, I don't know. Well, let's erase this part that we don't need anymore anyhow. I did this recap. So we have Sn. There is a, a subsequence such that this converges weakly to some function g in L2. What does it mean converges weakly? It means that for each uh, psi that belong to L2, you have that the integral of psi S and J converges to the integral of psi G. That's what it means, we convergence in L2, okay? So this is just, because the dual of S is, I don't know, yeah, either you know it, that, uh, you know, the L2, the unit ball of L2 is, unit, is weakly, Compact, or is it? Is, uh, you can prove it directly, but otherwise, it's a consequence of uh, Banacar Agula or this kind of abstract principle. It doesn't matter. Anyhow, I mean, you can find it in any book. And so you say, maybe your reaction is that uh, who cares? Yes, who cares? Well, let's look at this. L, sorry. Uh, so Sn is. Uh, uh, um, So I want to compute this S n compose T uh, minus S n, okay? And then I do this with some function that I, I choose it to be C1, some, some nice function. And I want to compute this quantity. So what it is, is psi, and then this is the sum from K that goes from zero up to N minus one of phi compose T K plus one, that is that minus phi composed TK. And these are now to be a, a telescopic sum. Everything canceled but the first and the last term. So this is equal to psi phi uh, uh, composed TN minus psi phi. Okay. And 
Now I can take uh, the limit uh, for uh, uh, Am I cheating here? Yeah, there is a small subtlety because I have to prove that the composition with this operator is continuous in the weak topology, right? Because I want to put the limit inside, but that is okay. So I I get that if I go in subsequence, this will go to G. And so I get that phi G composed T minus G is equal to the integral. So this one is again a correlation, right? This is zero average. So I will get zero over here in the limit, no matter which sequence I go. And so I get minus Psi phi. And since this is true for all phi, Psi, then it means that I just prove that the limit G composed T minus G is equal to phi. That means that phi is a co-boundary, okay? So you can be happy with that, but uh, there is a little catch, which is a little bit annoying. This is an L2 co-boundary, this way I proved it. No, G is just in L2. And uh, then the question is, is, how do you check that, uh, you know, this means that sigma equals zero implies that phi can be written like that. Now, it's not so easy that the function can be written like this, because if you take any invariant measure, and you take the average of this thing, this will be zero. So it means that your function is not zero average just with respect to the unique invariant measure absolutely continuous with respect to the bag. It's zero average with respect to any invariant measure, okay? And that is very difficult. For example, you can take any periodic orbit and that should be zero average along the periodic orbit because you can put an invariant measure on a periodic orbit. And so it just means that you can find the periodic orbit in which you sum the function along this periodic orbit. You do not get zero. That means that it cannot be written like this. And so sigma must be different from zero. So there is a very concrete criteria that you can check numerically very easily that tells you that the variance is not zero. But what I said is all bullshit because you cannot take the average with respect to some function that is not absolutely continuous with respect to the bag of a function that is L2 with respect to the bag. Because functions in L2 are defined only almost everywhere. And the functions that are uh, absolute invariant, they are all singular with respect to each other. So if you take another function, it will be supported. The support of another invariant measure will be supported on a zero measure set, which is exactly where this you have no control. So it's, it's, first you look at it, ah, fa wonderful, fantastic. And then you say, nah, it's completely useless. And then what is it? The point is that you it will be okay if you know that this is continuous. If this is G is continuous, then it is a continuous co-boundary. And then you can apply to it any measure. So, the problem is that, can I prove that G is continuous? So there is a general theory that is called Lifshitz theory that shows that in hyperbolic system, in fact, if you have a measurable co-boundary, then it should be smooth, okay? But Lifshitz theory is a bit messy, so let me just prove it for you directly. Let me just give a direct proof, <coughs> which is a proof that essentially can be used to uh, can be used to prove uh, uh, Lifshitz theorem essentially. Yes, I don't. I never saw anybody. Uh, there is a paper by Polycott in which, and also a paper by Jan Morris in which they use a similar idea to to prove Lifshitz theorem using transfer operator. But I never saw a proof in the case of, for example, an Ozop map or something or an Ozop flow. I mean, I think it should be possible, but. Uh, for an nose of map and an nose of flow, there is for an nose of flow. Actually, I don't know. For an nose of map, there is a paper by Delagliave uh, in which uh, they prove Lichy theorem uh, for that. In any case, let's just not worry. 
let's just define the following g tilde equal the sum from k that goes to one to infinity of l k phi okay. since this guy goes to zero exponentially in w11 for example then this is a well-defined function and this is a well-defined function in w11 which uh, it is, uh, I mean, in, in one dimension, it is continuous. In higher dimension, it is not enough. But uh, I mean, ah, no, because we did it with cones, right? So with cones, you know that this goes to zero in, in C1 even. So it goes to zero in C1. So so this is well-defined, this is a well-defined C1 function. That follows from our uh, argument that uh, the cone contracts, and so you have convergence in C1, okay? So you take this stuff, and now I try to compute the same business. I try to compute G tilde H star uh, minus G tilde compose T H star time L. You, ask, you can ask me, why do you compute this idiotic thing? Uh, well, I try to compute many things and just start now that this one works. And so <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so let's see what happened. It, it happens that you get the sum from uh, k going from two to infinity of L k plus one phi uh, h star, and uh, you get minus, and then you get L uh, k, uh, sorry, by one. This is just L k, and uh, you see, when you apply to this quantity, L applied to G compose T H star, this is equal to G tilde because it's composed with T, so it gets out of the transfer operator because the transfer operator is the sum on the pre-images. But if you take the pre-image and then you apply T, then you get the point you started with. So this gets out. And then you have L applied to H star, but that is the fixed point of L. So you get H star. So it means that uh, uh, here you just get, uh, uh, this operator disappear and you just get that one, which is L, uh, LK phi H star. Okay. And again, now you have a, Uh, telescopic series. I think all this business is an orgy of telescopic series, essentially, right? So you have a telescopic series, and only the first term survives, and the first term is L phi H star. Okay. Okay. On the other end, if you apply L to that, you will get uh, that L G minus and then minus uh, G. Uh, so sorry, and you multiply by h star, right? And then minus b h star is equal phi l phi h star. Again. Maybe I should have put h star immediately here. I don't know. Because I want it to be inside. Yeah, I want it to be. Uh, let me put h star there. So... So you look at this and you say, ah, but this is the same formula, right? This is the same stuff. This is the same stuff. Only it's a different function. So I can take the difference and I get that L of G minus G tilde H star is equal to G minus G tilde H star. Because I just take the difference between this guy that comes this function g i have no idea what it looks like but it is the weak limit of blah 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 of sn some weak, there can be more than one right because i got it as a weak limit so we it's just a compactness argument i just took a subsequence that converge so in principle i could get more than one function according to which subsequence i take so i know that there exists some functions that do that maybe there are many that do that and uh, here I just defined instead the function, I just gave a definition, and then I compute, 
and I get that the difference is a fixed point of the operator L. But if I take the average of this stuff, this is zero. You can easily check that the average of this stuff is zero because if you take the average of G, you see all these operators disappear and it's just the average of phi with respect to the invariant measure, and that is zero. And uh, also uh, the SN has zero average, so their weak limit has zero average. So this has zero average, so it cannot, uh, you see, we did, uh, because some of you uh, very uh, providentially, uh, I, I think it was some of you or I, I asked me, but are there other invariant measures? No, because you proved that there is an, a unique, absolutely continuous invariant measure that is regular, it is smooth. But maybe there are invariant measures that are not good, right? Just in L1. But I proved that this is not true. I proved that there is only one invariant measure that is absolutely continuous with respect to the day. This guy is in L2. This guy is C1. So this guy is absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue. And uh, it is an eigenvalue of the transfer operator. And uh, it is uh, zero average. It cannot be. Uh, because the only eigenvalue of the transfer operator is H star. There is nothing else. And so it means that there is only one possibility, that G minus G tilde time H star is equal to zero. That's the only possibility that is possible. But then, h star, we saw that is a strictly positive function. So it means that this difference must be zero. And that means that this function here, that is just only in L2, is equal, almost surely, to a C1 function. OK? And so it means that since this is C1, then it means that this is a C1 co-boundary, which is more than we needed, actually. We were happy with C0. And now the thing works, because now if you find the periodic orbit on which the average of phi is not 0, then it cannot be, because if you sum this along the periodic orbit, this is again a telescopic series. I told you it's an origin of telescopic series, and then it will get zero along a periodic orbit. Yep. No, I use the fact that uh, the transfer operator uh, converges essentially. Uh, the problem is that uh, um, for a nose of H star is not in general, while here H star uh, is uh, a measure, uh, is a function, for a nose of H star is the density of the invariant measure with respect to Lebesgue. But the invariant measure can be absolute, uh, uh, singular with respect to Lebesgue. So H star is a distribution actually. It's just and so it's, it's the radon nickelin derivative of a measure that is singular with respect to the bag. So uh, that creates some problem. So they are technical problem. I think they can be overcome, but it's not uh, for free. So that is uh, also, you know, it will have a support. And then you get that this one are equal on the support of this. But that is not everything. So yeah. You have to do something. You know, it's not. It's not simply completely obvious. Maybe you can try to do the same argument using a different operator. For example, the the operator associated to the measure of maximal entropy, because that uh, as one as uh, invariant <laughs> invariant eigenvector, eigenvector, right? So that is nice. But uh, I don't know. I I didn't think about it. I, mean, I, I see that there is a problem. I believe it can be overcome. But uh, I don't know, I thought about it uh, some time ago. I remember I thought about it for a couple of days and I couldn't uh, immediately fix it. So, I don't know. and then I got distracted by other things. Okay. All right, so, yeah.
No, no, L2 boundary you yes. can prove. Yes. Okay. The argument is the same. So okay. you get an L2 boundary, but then you need to do Lipschitz theory, okay? Okay. So here, to do Lipschitz theory, I use this trick, which is super fast, right? You just define this function and check that this function must be equal to that. And that's it. Okay, so the problem is to prove that uh, this is smooth. Yes, okay. you need the Lipschitz theory for uh, for Anosov, which is already exists, right? So that's why I was not motivated in spending much time on it, right? Because I, mean, I knew that the proof already exists. And, uh, you know, so I spent today out of curiosity. Uh, but then I couldn't fix it immediately, and I said, "Okay, look. I mean, if I spend more, then even I, I, mean, I yeah, I don't know. Uh, my curiosity was limited. What can I say?" Uh, Excuse me, but yeah? this is maybe a, a stupid question. But uh, what if you prove uh, instead of uh, uh, showing that S n is bounded in L two, yeah, you prove that it's bounded, I don't know, in H one or some subspace space that is uh, inside the C inside the continuous function. In this case, uh, this one, you mean? Yes, but how do you, do you prove that? Because they are from the fact, if you remember the argument, from the fact that sigma is zero, you just get that S n is bounded in L two. So there is no way to to do the... to do better. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe you can try to compute the fourth moment. I never tried. If you compute the fourth moment and you show that it's bounded, then maybe. Yeah. So because so, in that way you can because you take it, the yeah, subsequence. Imagine I, I never change. I don't remember, but if you compute the first moment that is bounded, then you can try to say that it's bounded in L4. Okay. So now that means that you would get convergence in the dual of L4, which I don't know what it is. It is I have to do one plus P or one plus Q, no, one one over P, one over Q equal one. And then you get which will be probably better than uh, it will be better than L2. I don't know. No, it, yeah, no. It will be smaller than L2, the, the dual, right? Yeah, it's, you see, analyst knows these things. <laughs> and, and so it's even worse, right? Because then uh, you get convergence in a, uh, maybe in L uh, one quarter or some bullshit like this. Uh, and then, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Okay. And... Yeah, okay, we get a convergence in some weak sense, but still the limit will be in L in L4. Okay, so what is the advantage of knowing that is in L4? Not much, no? Even if it is in LP, even if it is in L infinity, what do you gain? You have always the same problem that is defined only almost everywhere. And instead you wanted to define it. See, the point that you want to apply to it measures. So it must be at least continuous because measure are the dual of continuous functions. So if you do not get to continuous, you don't do anything. And to get to continuous, you would have to prove convergence in L infinity, right? There is no hope that is bounded in L infinity. It's actually probably false. Uh, maybe, yes, it is bounded in L infinity a posteriori because it's a cobalt. So if it is a co-bounder, it's bounded in L infinity. That is correct. But I don't know how to prove it. <laughs> so yes, if you have an independent way of proving that it's bounded in L infinity and not in L2, then you don't need this argument. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. Because that is the proof, right? That it's bounded in L infinity. So yeah, because once you know that, yeah, let, since we are talking about this, let me just, in case there is some person that didn't get the point, Now you can look at Sn a posteriori. And this is the sum from k from 0 up to n minus 1 of phi. But phi, now I discover that is g minus g composed t. And so this is composed t k, and this is k plus 1. Oh, look at that, another telescopic series. And uh, so you get what? You get g composed tn minus g. Okay, but G is a C1 function. So this is bounded uniformly by, so you just get that Sn in infinity is less or equal than G infinity twice. 
So from the fact that the, uh, so recapping, from the fact that the variance is, is zero, we get that the sum Sn, uh, what is it? Uh, I erased it. Okay, the, 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 the sum Sn, which is the sum of the function, let me write it again. The sum here is bounded in L2, and then studying, this means that it is an L2 co-boundary, and then study the L2 co-boundary, we find out that it is a C1 co-boundary, and then it follows that in fact, it's not bounded in L2, it's bounded in L infinity. But uh, I don't know how to prove it directly. If you could prove it directly, then you would not need to use Lipschitz theorem. Or uh, this, uh, this is kind of, uh, I don't know, a poor man version of uh, Lipschitz theory, right? I mean, some done by hand like that, okay? It's just some trick. Okay, so I don't know if there is some other question about uh, this. I would say conclude my discussion of the, um, of the CLT. Uh, well, maybe I just say two more words about this. One word is that, of course, uh, if you saw uh, what I did, then you see that essentially I, I did an expansion to second order. But nobody prevent me from doing an expansion to third order, fourth order, and so on and so forth. So I can compute correction to the CLT. Also, what I, you see, if you look, okay, so let me, how much time do I have? Because maybe I wanted to talk uh, about 25 minutes. Yeah. I don't know, because I wanted to talk about another subject to finish, but okay, but let me just talk a little bit about this stuff since I, I am on the subject and then if I have some time, I will just say more about something else, but it doesn't make much sense. So you see, let's go back. Imagine that I want to look at the probability that Sn, uh, over square root of n belongs to some small interval, a plus uh, delta over square root of n, b ma uh, a minus delta over square root of n. So, uh, let's say that I want to look at something absurd like this, right? I mean, just to say something. I want to have really precise information. Can I do this? Well. You know, to estimate this, I can just take, so I have, this is A, this is uh, A minus, uh, let's say this, I call it A minus, and this I call it A plus. This is A minus, this is A plus. So you can say, yeah, yeah, you cannot do that because you did the computation only for smooth function, right? Yes, I did the computer. You can go around that, but let's not me do that. I just do an estimate just taking a function that looks like this. This is smooth, and of course, the probability of um, uh, Sn to be in the support of this function is uh, is uh, uh, bigger than, th than that. So you can just compute the expectation with respect to this function to estimate this probability. Because this function is one here, and is very small there. But how, how small do you want? This must be small with respect to this interval, right? Otherwise, it's completely stupid. And so it, this is height one, and this but be small than square root of n. So it means that the derivative is, the derivative is of order of square root of n, at least. You cannot do a function of this type that is so concentrated with a derivative that is uh, smaller than one over square root of n, than square root of n, because it has to go, you know, in in a, in a distance of square root of uh, one over square root of n. So this is one over square root of n. It has to go to one. So that is. Uh, and actually, no, is that really, really true? No, because you don't want one. You want since this is square root of n, you want this to be square root of n. Actually, so this will be of order n. Okay. So maybe I exaggerated, right? This is very hard to do, I think. But in any case, I mean, just to say, to tell you, so you can apply all your thing 
but you will get uh, a gigantic uh, a gigantic norm of the function. And since there was a mistake that was a prime over square root of n, this is total catastrophe, right? Because this will be of order square root of n, which is gigantic. But while this probability it will be of order one if I divide it, uh, uh, I divide it like that. This is like a, a delta function of this interval, right? So it just, it, it is high. The integral of this function is one. And so, uh, that is what, uh, so, so you, you, the mistake is much bigger than, uh, than the function. So it's clear that, uh, and part of this mistake, if you remember, was coming from the fact that I was throwing away the integral from uh, uh, square root, from lambda naught, uh, square root of n to infinity, right? This part of the Fourier transform, I was estimating by, uh, by by these things. And uh, so it's kind of clear that if you could uh, get uh, control for bigger lambda, then uh, you could uh, do better, okay? And so it means that you would like to study the operator L lambda, uh, not for lambda smaller than lambda naught, but for all lambda. If you can do that, you will certainly get better estimate and uh, you know for example we have a paper with Kazun in which we play this game and the point is that can you do that well the answer is yes in some cases for expanding map you can smooth expanding map you can for piecewise you, you can right for an of no for an of is unclear because it turns out that uh, this operator, if you look at it, uh, where is it? I erased it, but whatever. I mean, this operator, I, I write it here, is equal to L, e to the i lambda phi. And uh, it is extremely similar to the operator, the, the twist operator that you get to study a suspension that has phi as a ceiling. It's more or less the same operator. And so this is very, very similar to proving decay of correlation to study what happened for a big lambda for this operator is very, very similar to prove decay of correlation for a flow. And uh, there are techniques to do that, but uh, essentially the Dolgopiat technique or uh, the technique due to Suji, for example, uh, but uh, the problem is that uh, we know how to do it uh, for suspension over expanding maps, but uh, for uh, an also flow, we do not. Uh, unless the flow is contact, and there is no reason why this should be contact, I mean, the equivalent of contact. Or there is a recent paper by Suji and Zhang in which they show that generically the answer is, um, Yes, for uh, uh, three-dimensional flow. So that would be equivalent to a suspension over a, a nose of map in two dimension, okay? So then there is a technique. It's a, this, I, I don't think ever nobody ever tried, but maybe using this technique, you can show that if you have a two-dimensional nose of map, then you can prove probably that there is a, uh, you can compute the correction term, which is called Edgewood expansion to the CLT uh, for uh, generic fee, whatever the hell that means. Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, this is, this, yeah. I don't know. But it's, uh, but it's an analogy, it's not really a precise analogy because this guy can be negative for it. It must be negative, zero average, right? So you have a ceiling that is negative or positive. It doesn't mean a freaking thing, right? So it's just an analogy. I mean, you look at the uh, computation that you have to do and they are exactly the same and that, that, it happens, and the fact that this function is positive plays essentially no role in, uh, in, uh, for example, in Dolgupiat argument. 
And so since it plays no role, you can copy it and it works, but uh, it's not exactly that you can interpret this as being a uh, suspension, not really. So I don't know. Uh, yeah. I don't know. This, let's say, is a situation that uh, I find it annoying. I think it would be very nice to be able to compute correction to the CLT because if you want to to see what happened on a small interval, then you need correction to the CLT, for example. Uh, but uh, but yeah, we can do it only in limited situation. In the situation in which we can do it, what you get, you get that the spectrum. is equal, is always contained in some uh, disk with less or equal than some alpha smaller than one, uh, essentially for all lambda. And so that means that uh, uh, you always decay, I mean, the contributions that come from large lambda, they always decay exponentially. And so they do not play. I think there is a uniform alpha, actually, right? Is it? No, 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 sorry, sorry. Yeah, uh, sorry. This is uh, 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 the for all uh, alpha, uh, lambda bigger than some lambda, than, than lambda zero, for example, right? Lambda zero than before. Yeah. For, for the large one, right? If you are close to zero, then you get to one, yeah, of course. But if you are, uh, then everything goes. So the term that I, this term here that I threw away, because here there is also e to the i lambda over n. I mean, yeah, here there is the integral of e to the i s n lambda over square root of n, okay? And uh, uh, for lambda large, this is actually exponentially small. So it doesn't create uh, any, that shows that the, the mistake that I threw away, they are really irrelevant. And all the uh, correction come from nearby zero. So from the Taylor expansion, essentially. Ah, okay, you can do for shift of final tap, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the shift of finite type and the expanding map, they are not really so different, right? It's kind of almost the same thing. Yeah, no, not really, but yeah. Yeah. Ah, okay, okay. You are right. You are right. Yeah. Okay. That is... Uh, and of course, uh, uh, there is another issue that uh, since we are talking about that, that uh, this uh, uh, tells me what happened to the Birkhoff sum uh, at a given time. But you may be interested, for example, in this quantity. In many situations, you are. For example, let me just tell you a situation in which you are interested in a slightly different thing. Let's talk about a system of this type. Okay, so this is the simplest possible case of a fast slow system. It has one variable that is fast and one variable that is slow. The fast variable is X and the slow variable is Z, which each time changes only by an amount epsilon. Okay, and uh, the general case is when this depend on Z and this depend on Z, so this is, um, I think a very interesting case that I would like to study. I spent quite some time studying this type of problem with uh, limited success, uh, but uh, yeah, okay, with uh, together with mostly together with Jacopo de Simoi and Roberto Castorini. Uh, but uh, okay, uh, if you look at this and you want to see what 
the dynamics is this is the dynamics and you want to understand what happened for large time to the variable zn okay then what do you want to do then you want to look at zn and that is going to be equal to z let's say this is zero zero plus epsilon the sum from k that goes from zero to n minus one of omega composed f k of x zero and this is a Birkhoff sum okay and uh, And uh, if you so you if you want to understand what is the long time behavior of the variable z n, then you have to understand this sum here. And uh, of course uh, you have to decide at which time you want to look at it. Now, it the map the map f is a map that has, uh, uh, let's say that F has a unique invariant measure, which is uh, a, phys a unique physical measure. If F has a unique physical measure, it may very well happen that, uh, let's call it mu, mu of omega is zero, okay? And then we are exactly in the situation that I was discussing before. So we know that uh, this, will converge to something when n is the of order epsilon minus two. So I can look at the variable, the epsilon of t equal epsilon sum from k from zero to epsilon minus two t minus one, maybe integer part of omega Compose f k of x. Okay, and that is uh, a, a exactly the situation of before, right? Because this is n, and this is square root of n. And uh, uh, so this one will go to a Gaussian. Okay. which will be centered at zero and will have a spread one. And that means that if you wait this time, the variable z will be more or less distributed uh, in, all, in all the space. Uh, but, uh, okay, there are things that you may want to know more. You want to say, okay, this thing here, this is, uh, uh, you can interpolate you know, uh, continuously be between uh, the these uh, discrete times, and uh, uh, and then you get a continuous function. I mean, this one is something that jumps, right? Because here there is, uh, but it jumps every t epsilon square steps, right? When you move over time epsilon square, this jumps by one. Okay, but uh, okay, so it will be something like this, and it jumps by epsilon. So this is like that. And then after a time, epsilon square may be here, and then it is here, and then it is there. So that may be the trajectory, right? Every trajectory has every time uh, epsilon square, it will have a jump of order epsilon. And then you can just join it. And now you get a continuous function. And this I call the epsilon of t, okay? And now I may ask myself, okay, but uh, this is a continuous function, and so it's a random variable because for each initial condition, I will get a different a different path. And then I can ask myself, how does it look, the measure of this path? So if I look in the space of continuous function, 
what is the measure that describes this path. I don't want only to know what happened at a certain time, at the time t. I want to know also the correlation between time t and time s, for example. Okay, and that this will be some pro, some stochastic process now, you know, from time zero to some t, and uh, and then you can ask yourself uh, this question, and uh, uh, let me see how much time I have to say something. I have seven minutes, so there is no hope that I can say anything really serious about this. But so no no proof, no nothing, just blah blah blah. You know, it's the end. We are all tired, so we are down to. Uh, like a bar uh, type of discussion, okay? So uh, what uh, you can prove, you can do a computation. This is a nice computation that you can do. You can uh, look at Z epsilon T plus S minus Z epsilon T uh, to the square, take expectation, and check that this is less or equal than the constant T minus S square. That's a computation that you can do. It's just with the tools that we have, you can do it and you will get this estimate. And this means that uh, this, uh, 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 the measure that describes the path, uh, the path of the uh, is uh, satisfy Kolmogorov compactness uh, principle. And so this means that it is compact, it is uh, tight in uh, the space. So these measures. Because for each epsilon, you have a different measure. No? So you want to take the limit epsilon going to zero to see what is the limiting process that you would get if you take epsilon very, very small. And uh, since uh, uh, this uh, uh, computation tells you that all these measures are tight, then there is a subsequence that converge. And so you can, uh, you know that there exists a Z, which is, the weak limit of for epsilon going to zero of this process, okay? and uh, and so it means that indeed, as epsilon becomes small, this uh, path they look more and more like a, a fixed uh, random process, and uh, surprise, surprise, uh, this is just Brownian motion. And uh, you know, if you want to see, uh, there are several ways of proving it. And uh, but uh, okay, I mean, this year there is a huge literature that uh, I, in this time, I cannot even uh, explore. But uh, uh, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of results about about, about this. But uh, uh, the reason why I'm kind of interested about it because it gives you some information about uh, the invariant measure of that system, right? The invariant measure of that system, then it should be something that it is, uh, so this is the variable X and this is the variable Z. And now you ask yourself, well, what is going to be the invariant measure of that system? What is going to look like? I mean, this uh, uh, fast low system when epsilon is very small. But when epsilon is very small, you know that uh, Z uh, must be more or less uniformly distributed here. On the other hand, X is distributed according to the invariant measure of small f. So the, it means that uh, the invariant measure of that system should be very similar to Lebesgue time H star Lebesgue, where H star is the invariant measure. Uh, I call it mu, sorry, here I call it mu. This is the invariant measure of f. I it didn't even tell you what f is. It doesn't really matter. It could even be in an also flow. Okay. So now, of course, in which sense this is closed, you have to discuss. Is this is a kind of war? So it's kind of complicated. But still, uh, in first approximation, the invariant measure must 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 look like this. So you get precise information on how the invariant measure up to a certain precision must look for this system. And that is not so easy to answer in other ways, in other, because maybe for this system you can, uh, for this system in particular, you can 
try to do what uh, let's say that f is an expanding map right then you can try to do a transfer operator type of argument like the one that i did for the expanding map uh, if you are on a torus for example you can decompose in fourier mode and then things work and then you have a lot instead of having one operator you have one operator for each fourier mode it's boring computation but you can do it and you can show for example that indeed there is uh, a, a some uh, uh, invariant mesh so there is a physical mesh uh, in the sense that I discussed it. Maybe you remember that I, dis I, I defined physical measure as the measure that you get starting from a measure that is absolutely continuous with respect to the bag. So you take a measure that is absolutely continuous with respect to the bag, you do Krilo Bogoliubu starting from that, and then you get some measure, and that for me is a physical measure essentially, right? And uh, so you show that there are physical measures. They indeed. Uh, uh, have the property that uh, th that uh, that you like, so they have uh, they are absolutely continuous with respect to the bag in this case, but uh, you don't know how many they are because again it's a compactness argument. Right? You just know that uh, the maximal eigenvalue are finite multiplicity. Okay, right. But what they are, how many they are, you don't know, uh, and uh, how do they look like, you don't know. But, uh, you know, using this type of thing, then you get information. They must look more or less like this. If there are more, of course, you don't know that because it could be that, you see, it's a little bit like, so this example that I, I, I like, right? Because, uh, so for example, like that is very hard to get uniqueness unless you have very tight bound on what is uh, the regularity of, but quantitative bound. You need quantitative bound on, the, for example, what is the derivative of the invariant measure, for something like that. Because it could be that, you see, you could have that, it could be Lebesgue, so you say, ah, the invariant measure is Lebesgue, that is just, you can imagine it's just the function one. And you say, ah, so the, this is how the invariant measure looks like. But in fact, the real invariant measure could be like this, right? Where this oscillation, each oscillation happened to epsilon to the minus 10, for example. So, sorry, epsilon to the 10, some very, very small scale. And here there is a gain in all. And, and then, uh, I mean, maybe there is another one that is the same, but it is, uh, you know, uh, singular with respect to this. I don't know. It's not so easy to rule out this possibility. And this possibility does happen already in stochastic process, because imagine that you have a random walk. And the random walk, does jumps of size two, okay? So it just uh, jump on the left of uh, of two step or jump on the right of two steps. And then you compute and you say, ah, the random walk converges to a Brownian motion, ah, very well. So I look it at the time t and the measure, if you are on a, on a circle, for example, not on the line, then it will converge to uniform distribution, exactly like here. So the distribution of the, the Brownian motion on a circle will be just after some time more or less constant. And you say, you see, there is only invariant, one invariant measure in this Lebesgue. But then you look at it and you discover that if you start from an odd side, you will, ever, you will always be in odd side because you jump by two. And if you start on an even side, you will always be on an even side. So the invariant measure, in fact, is not Lebesgue at all. It's something that goes up and down. Or is something on all the odd side and zero on all the even. And the other one, there is another one that is exactly the contrary. So this could happen here. And to rule it out is not so obvious, unless you know that the derivative is bounded, right? It's not, if you get the bound on the derivative, then you know that it cannot change in such a small time, and then maybe you can control something. But that is a problem that is kind of outstanding, and uh, I'm worth, I worked quite a bit on it, but... I have to say that for the moment is open. So maybe some young people with more energy will do progress in this problem, studying this type of system, which uh, I mean the general system that one would like to study. And with this, I conclude is a system of this type. Which is, a situ which is a situation that uh, this is more similar to Apple because my 
how to say, what is in the back of my head is a situation, this should be a model of heat transport, okay? So this has physical relevance. So this, you can imagine that you have a bunch of particles, this is the energy, and so the energy, yeah, nearby system has changed a little bit of energy, very little, and so you have that the energy is conserved if you have a lot of systems that do not interact with each other. But if, if they have a, a small interaction, then the energy, the total energy is conserved, but the single energy of the particle will be not. And so it will evolve, but it will evolve very slowly if the interaction is, is very, very slow, it's very, very small. And, but the problem is that the exchange of energy will depend from the energy of the nearby system and the dynamics of every single system will depend on its own energy. So this should depend on Z and this should depend on Z. So if you should consider system of this type in which everything depends on everything. But if you look at the literature, then most of the people just study um, uh, skew product, right? Skew product, but this does not depend on Z and this does not depend on Z. And for that, they can get the result. Okay, big deal. Yes, you know, understand. Oh, no, big deal, yes, because it, it's not obvious, but is very far from what it can be of physical interest. And with this, I stop. I talk too much. I'm sorry. And that's it. Thanks a lot for listening to me. And have a nice weekend or whatever. Any question? Not? OK, thanks a lot again to Carlangelo Oliveira. Okay, so uh, welcome to the last uh, lecture of this uh, workshop. And it's the last lecture of uh, Caroline Wormel talking about numerical methods in non-hyperbolic chaos. Thanks. All right, thanks. So um, uh, yes, I suppose this is the last one. And um, uh, well, as it's sort of this lecture is going to follow on from the last lecture. Uh, and I suppose this is really the message uh, that the way that we like to approximate Koopman and transfer operators um, is with perhaps um, is um, sorry is is a is a kind of Galerkin approximation. Um, uh, almost almost universally, this is what people do, and at some level, what this is is least squares in a fancy way. Uh, and so I think just just to sort of perhaps give you a concrete uh, sort of. Going off this uh, this this claim, I will give you a concrete example uh, of an example of this. So, um, well, okay, we can just try and do at least let's do least squares. Let's pretend we're statisticians. We have some function u that we want to approximate by something very simple. For example, a line. Um, you imagine I don't know. This is a, a polling. You know what? I don't know. Like, like take your favorite statistical uh, question. Um, and usually we only have a sort of set, I mean, perhaps we can only evaluate you at a finite number of points, but uh, in general, let's say that we um, have a, or, or, you know, we, we have to sample it so we can't get an infinite number of samples. We just have some data points of values X and uh, you guys. And uh, well, again, we want to make a linear approximation of it and we should think about how you want to do it. And so now I have, um, well, I mean, somehow I'm trying to make a good linear approximation of it, and I just I just did it by eye. I just was like, okay, this is what I think A and B should be, and I have a line. But I mean, this is I mean, somehow you know, this is a bit. Uh, we man we can do better than this, uh, and so we want to find some uh, way to say, well, this linear approximation looks as close to the true approximation as possible, and well, okay, somehow you do at least squares because it's linear and it's nice and if you recall statistics 101 um you sort of well i mean you can sort of do things by looking at means and variances and so on or covariances but it basically boils down to creating what in statistics they call a design matrix but it's just a matrix of your your well like your first function which is a constant function out the front of the a the thing you're multiplying your a by and the thing you're multiplying your b by which is just x linear function uh, you can see that the best choice of A and B, so it's like A star, B star, whatever, uh, is going to be, has this expression. So you take your, the values of U of X that you have sampled and you apply this kind of matrix, which is based on that. Um, so, I mean, and somehow what this is saying is it's, take, it's saying, well, you take this 
you know, to try and maybe try and find a you 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 sort of want to take your u your your you know your your u of x's and dot it with the thing that you want it to get your coefficient for but then i mean somehow these two columns are not in the light are not sort of orthogonal so you need to deorthogonalize it um okay so if we do this uh you see that we can get a line that is perhaps better than the one we had before um and well that's great um uh, the idea of i suppose what we want to do is we actually want to do this with our Kuhn operators so uh let's say that we take some initial function u, which is a linear function, a plus bx, and we turn it into, well, we apply our Koopman operator, so we compose it with our function f, um, So in, and then we get, we get some function like this. And you can see that this is, this u here is actually quite nonlinear. Um, so, sorry, we'll just, um, it is, you know, it is, fuck off, sorry. Um, Yes, so it's it's this kind of this function here. So I took uh, three plus u is three plus x, also three plus x, but then u is three plus f of x, and we get something like this. And okay, well, if we just do, I mean, we just, you know, if we're really silly. We just decide, well, the best way to approximate this is using at least squares linear approximation, and we get some flat line like that. Um, and okay, so somehow we could we could maybe change around our alpha and our beta. Um, I don't know, zero and make this one or make this I don't know, minus a minus one or something. Like so we can we can do this for, you know for any kind of a alpha and beta. We're just applying this kind of sine naught stuff to our linear sum of it. Um, and uh, okay, well somehow this is a linear process. Like the a and b you get out are, are linear in alpha and beta. Uh, and so we can sort of write, um, and so and so so if we write u as a sum, our vector of u's, in fact, so this is like u, sorry, this should be like u u u one, u two, u three, blah blah blah, as this vector, um, we can approximate, uh, do our best fit these alphas and betas, and we get this operator out here, which is precisely this Koopman matrix that I was telling you about. Um, but of course, for linear fun where our dictionary, the sort of sets of functions that we're, the basis of functions that we're approximating on are uh, linear functions. Uh, and well, okay, so we're looking at the doubling map. Um, and okay, so somehow this here is obviously taking two by two, well, two, you know, two, two, two sets of coefficients to two other sets of coefficients. So we can see here that it is a um, two by two matrix. And well, okay, maybe somehow this is a really dumb approximation of the Koopman operator um uh for the doubling map um and um well okay if we try and say for example look at the spectrum of this Koopman operator we can see that well of course it gets the first eigenvalue because one is a constant function is 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 invariant it's invariant in the statistical approximation but we can see that it actually gets the second eigenvalue very closely um uh which is which is the which is one half. So, uh, of course, we can't get any more eigenvalues correctly because we've only allowed ourselves a two by two matrix. Um, but so it can only have two eigenvalues. But you can see that the um, operator is uh, well. I mean, somehow this is the most important of all of these guys because it's the furthest closest to one, the unit circle. Um, does does that does anyone have questions about that? <laughs> Um, um, this is, I mean, I think the answer, I think the answer is kind of because, um, the, because, yeah, because it's a doubling map, because it's linear. Um, uh, well, you know, somehow, somehow it's piecewise linear. If you, um, uh, you could also say actually that it's con somehow well, well maybe I'll, maybe I'll show you a bit later but you can actually if you swap this psi naught and psi one around you actually get an approximation of the transfer operator by self adjointness um and so then the well the tra somehow the transfer operator does have this closed subspace of one and x because well one is one like one is invariant under the for the doubling map because if one is just the invariant measure and it preserves the invariant density rather and it preserves that and then x you can do a little calculation and see that 
that somehow linear linear functions are a closed subspace in the transfer operator of the doubling map. No, absolutely not, because it's not, it's not, it's special to, yeah, I mean, like, we could try it, and we might, well, I don't know, let's try it, why not? Um, f of x is now, I don't know, what number do we want? 3.8x times 1 minus x. Um, okay, so cool. Um, why is it now, where's our, okay. And then, okay, then we're going to do a little Koopman guy, and, well, I mean, okay, so obviously, these these gray ones are wrong. Okay, so somehow then we get zero and one, but I think that's just because it's um, the doubling map is so the logistic map is even about its center. So I mean, somehow you have you have a you have a you have I don't know. Let's say a oh no, I can't rub this off. Um, um, you have like a, you have like a linear function. I mean. I don't know, a half one, and you take you take like a function like this, and then here's your logistic map, and so this stuff here, let's say under the well, okay, um, under the transfer operator, which I said is the adjoint, uh, this this negative here gets mapped to this point with the same derivative that this, I'm gonna write it. this negative here gets mapped to this point, and this negative one here positive one, exactly the opposite, gets mapped to the same point. Uh, this is not a very good drawing, but somehow the, these two cancel each other out. You should do the calculation. Um, uh, anyway, um, but yeah, somehow, I mean, even though this, okay, so I've showed that it works perfectly for a special example and it absolutely doesn't really do anything for a non-special example. Um, uh, the idea of this is actually what engineers call dynamical mode decomposition. So this is not extended dynamical mode decomposition. This is just normal dynamical mode decomposition. Um, so we just take, instead of taking, I mean, somehow you have a high dimensional system and you have a lot of different coordinates. You don't just have one, you have like one. That is, so you use your dictionary one, x1, x2, x3, x4, and so on and so forth. And somehow um, this actually works quite well if you have, you know, some big, I don't know, some big system of PDEs. Um, uh, at least often, often it does. Um, so I mean, somehow this is this is this is mildly deranging. As um, I mean, sort of glorified analysts, I suppose, because we always want to think what happens when n goes to infinity. And there, they just have. I mean, they just have two coordinates. And um, but anyway, I mean, I think that's kind of interesting. Um, and maybe there's actually there is some way that we can study why that works uh, if you sort of define some appropriate infinite dimensional, a high dimensional system. Um, you know, which probably doesn't have as many Lyapunov and of it pos you know, as large a dimension as the sort of system which you immerse it. But anyway, um, that's dynamical mode decomposition. And of course, in general, you have a lot of, instead of having just one x1, so one and x, you might have one and then x and then a bunch of other functions that are perhaps nonlinear. Um, and well, I mean, again, these are just, we just had some matrices that we computed, our you know, our Koopman matrix out of, and you can more or less just try the same thing. This is the whole idea of this Lurkin approximation. Um, and okay, and perhaps also you, you yeah. Um, and of course this, um, somehow this is what we're all doing. This is a picture I showed you last time. Um, and uh, well, okay, so for example, uh, it's not, for example, what Julia was doing uh, with the Lagrange Chebyshev methods um, is, try, is discretizing this operator L but she was choosing uh, using using polynomials, uh, but she was choosing some very fancy um, or some very careful, well chosen nodes. So I mean, actually, which look like this. Um, so so the, these are these Chebyshev nodes that you saw, and um, well, somehow, um, uh, and, and perhaps you may also remember that she was taking a lot of sort of product sort of cross sums between between I suppose Chebyshev polynomials. Uh, and Chebyshev polynomials with the transfer operator applied to them. Um, and yeah, I mean, somehow this this is kind of more or less uh, what you, the sort of thing that you see um, and indeed for Ulam's method. Um, so often when you're, when you're doing it, like, I mean, so Stefano, in fact, I think was discretizing the transfer operator. Um, uh, but because this is, this is all, um, 
where when you actually do it in practice for some you know giant system, often what you do is you take a lot of points and you apply the Koopman operator to them. Or so rather you you push them forward and you see which bump function, which characteristic function they live in. So your dictionary out here is characteristic functions. And um uh yeah, so somehow you choose you so I mean generally you're not computing integrals to find out the sort of where stuff goes. You're taking a lot of little points inside your little partition, which are usually sampled from LeBeg. And um yeah, it sort of works. Um and, and and yeah, you sort of you sort of get this uh, approximation um of your transfer operator in some piecewise constant basis. Um yeah, but um sort of perhaps EDMD is kind of one of the more general versions of this, um, well, yeah, it's a sort of somehow generalization of all of these. Of course, the way that you study these is not the same. Well, I mean, somehow a lot of these have special structure to them. Um, so for example, this matrix here, which it tells you how orthogonal your, your, di your, these basis functions are is usually is kind of, is often diagonal. So it certainly was for Julia and it is for Erlen's method as well. I mean, so for the Grand Chebyshev and it certainly is for Erlen's method. Um, so neither Julia nor Stefano had to think about this. Um, and in fact, for Ulam's method, it's very nice because generally you get some kind of, this matrix here looks kind of sparse. And I'll, I'll show you that in a second. Um, so, um, uh, right. So we have, I mean, if we think about this map that we looked yesterday, so it's just a little perturbation of the doubling map to make it, the spectrum a bit more interesting. Um, well, somehow... Are uh, we going to make a partition of our space? Um, and uh, okay, compute the characteristic functions on the partition. So this 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 piece of code here, just this this thing here, is one. If the, it, well, I mean, obviously it's a logical statement saying that what you know the jth element of this partition, uh, and so that x n is between the jth element of this partition and the j plus one element. So it, it lies in this thing, and it's um, between say these two numbers. And it's uh well it's somehow it's zero if it's true and one if it's one if it's true and zero if it's not you know true being one and false being zero and the same thing but with the Kuppen operator applied to it and we get I mean somehow okay so psi naught looks like this big matrix of ones and zeros saying well we started with this partition or this you know some point that we've well some point in minus one one and it lies in um lies in the, the all that sorry this is a point and it lies we know that the first point lies in the first partition and so do all of the other early points anyway i mean it's not particularly meaningful uh or not particularly easy to see but when you actually compute your koopman operator um you get some kind of matrix like this so black says that there is the, the you know the koopman the, the entry in the koopman matrix is large and well is is non-zero um it's something it's something approaching one and zero suggests that it's not. So here you can sort of see that it's empty. You can see that most of it is empty because somehow if you take an element of your partition and you compose it with, you try and think of what happens with to this function. So how much of this, how much this function looks like, how much that's EJ. So this is the element of the partition, how much it looks like this one. Generally, this is going to look, this this guy here is going to get moved to some other kind of partition like this, and it will be very sparse, and it will mostly not see these partition elements. Um, so you get matrices that look like this, and you can actually see that in this case, uh, I suppose generally one dimension, the sort of, you know, pattern of, of non-zero elements in your matrix are, um, they look like the map, sort of the map kind of rotated 90 degrees. Um, uh, yeah, but I mean, somehow computationally, this is very nice because you can you can sort of define kinds of matrix types called sparse matrices where you um, you you don't actually encode lots and lots of zeros in your matrix. So I mean, here for example, if we try and look at if we actually try and look at the Koopman operator, um, not that Koopman operator, this Koopman operator, um, we see that. We can see that there's lots of zeros. So somehow this is very boring for our computer to do and we can speed it up. Anyway, um, ah, I bugged it up, sorry, because I do not evaluate everything. 
Okay. Uh, the other thing to see, the other thing that you can see about the Koopman operator, I'd say about Ulam's method, is that it's not actually. Um, it sort of gets so. For example, it gets the first element of the spectrum right, and it probably would actually. It might, it might get these other two elements, but um, it has it has because uh, basis elements are characteristic functions. They're in BV, so somehow they're it's like close to saying they're in C one, and there is in C one, but they're not in anything higher. So when you try and do your approximation, actually, what you see is that you are going to you you're not be, going to be able to show that there's convergence in um uh how would you say um you're not going to be able to see that there's convergence in um like within the sort of essential spectrum bound that you get for C1 uh because somehow you you just can't work with it proof wise um you you can't say anything about it when you do the proof and somehow when you do the proof it it actually it actually really comes out in the um in the numerics uh so you can see here that we can't really we can we can't say anything about the spectrum here. Um, generally, of course, because you have this, I mean, because this operator is a finite dimensional matrix, you can't actually see some kind of continuous spectrum directly. Generally, what you see is a lot of dots, just like a bunch of a bunch of eigenvalues that are sort of kind of continuously distributed, more or less, um, or certainly kind of very unstably distributed. So if I somehow change this, if I change my matrix very slightly, these would all be in completely different places. Um, but yeah, so that that is that is one uh, sort of I suppose downside of using irregular basis functions. But perhaps the upside is that you have um, nice uh, operators like this. Um, nice. So you have you have nice matrices like that with all this good structure. Um, it actually, I, it's sort of. I mean, I, I don't. I've, perhaps there's things I'd rather say in the next however long. Uh, but it is actually it is actually the case that with these kinds of Koopman operators, where you have where if you have this approximating the Koopman operator of psi naught. Um, you can actually, um, sorry, if you have your psi one approximating the Koopman operator of psi zero, you can actually write your Koopman operator. Um, so this is so that's your that's your Koopman operator. You can actually take a um, well, let's say the sort of transpose of this. So instead, you get a set of psi naught star psi one. Well, okay, without that, you get psi one star psi naught. So you're just flipping it. I mean, this is just this is just playing around with some matrices. Um, you can uh, sort of you can actually get your transfer operator as well. Um, uh, so I would I think just a little dash is a bit confusing. So I'll just write it like this. Um, uh, and well, okay. In this case, if we use say our ULM method, should have done that. Oh, hang on, no, we shouldn't use the Koopman dash. We should use the transfer operator. Uh, we can actually, for example, um, so again, this the, the this this Ulam's method thing, the points were sampled from Lebesgue, um, and so the transfer operator, sort of, with respect to Lebesgue measure, um, if you take its eigenve eigenvector, um, it's its leading eigenvector. So this is this is this is taking the, well, let's say the thing from the one eigenvalue. You can see here that uh, the Ulam, like this this thing you get using Ulam's method, actually approximates your transfer your invariant density very nicely. Um, and uh, so somehow I plotted against the true density uh, or a sort of much better approximation of the density, let's say. Uh, and I mean, somehow this is a thing that people like to use Ulam's method for um, to look at. Um, well, one thing they like to do is look at invariant measures. Uh, you can also use it to look at, um, it's again, so it, it is actually very close to the um, sort of adjoint of the Koopman operator, but some your basis functions are not always orthogonal. Um, so here, yes, you can see that um, right. The second eigenvalue is um, again the the second eigenvector. So this is the eigenvector that you get at the second eigenvalue um, is which is here outside the central spectrum. You can see that this you have this kind of um, eigen thing like this, uh, and this is. Um, like you've had, you used some C1 function, for example, and you can see that you have some approximation to this. I mean, I haven't normalized it correctly, but if you, if you, this is a, this, this is a linear scaling of this, close enough. Um, uh, and of course, it's continuous in C1, as we expect from the theory. Uh, I would just say you can, you can look at the eigenvectors of the Koopman operator, say for this simple system. And in fact, we did for the Lozzy map. Um, but I mean, at least uh, you, you, you were sort of liable to get. Perhaps particularly with the Lamps method, but I don't want to say that necessarily. You you are perhaps particularly liable to get um, 
uh, sort of behavior like this. So you get you get some eigenfunctions that jump around, and this is because somehow, well, I mean, this is not the true eigen value vector of the, of the Koopman operator. It's going to be something in the dual space of C1. So this is trying to approximate something that isn't even a function, this blue guy. Um, yeah, so somehow there are some... Uh, I mean, you would actually also see this with, with with polynomials if you had a high enough, if you had enough polynomials, um, you sort of have to perhaps squint a little bit with the Zulam method, well, with any method really, and sort of make sure that your partition is not. I don't know. There's there's there's, there's stuff out there. I think um, Gary Froyland and uh, et al have sort of tried to understand what these kinds of eigenfunctions can mean uh, in the context of um, in the context of Ulam's method, and I think also of Fourier base methods so sort of you know high order methods as well um anyway that's uh the the you know there's questions of interpretation here but certainly sometimes as you saw with the lozzy map last time you can um you can say some interesting things uh you, you can get some meaningful information out of both of these guys um so yeah uh I should perhaps now maybe say something about well the convergence rate of all these things, um, and so there are actually two parameters that we need to look at here. There's a the number of points that we're approximating our functions with, um, uh, and so we're trying to do our you know compute our you know our Koopman matrix or our transfer operator matrix with, um, and then there's also the number of basis functions that we need to look at. Um, so I suppose, and I mean, okay. So 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 in many cases we don't actually. I mean, okay. So so when we do this uh, to study the convergence, we sort of somehow need to. Um, generally, when we deal with data problems, we try and study the convergence of the number of data points going to infinity first, and so then we get some kind of continuum approximation that you get by computing integral. You know, some continuum approximation to our matrix that you get by computing integrals. Uh, but then it will be like a K, say a k by k matrix, and then we want to say. How does that converge in some meaningful sense to the sort of the true operator, the true infinite dimensional Kuhn or transfer operator? Um, and well, actually, uh, in like at least in, on some level, this this n to infinity convergence is a much easier question. Um, and I can actually perhaps prove to you that you do get this convergence and what rate you are. Um, so ultimately, what we're interested in, our Koopman matrix looks a lot like this. It's two k by k matrices. Uh, and perhaps recall that these are both matrices where the columns are sort of different samples and the rows are different basis uh, vectors. Um, and so somehow we can sort of go back to uh, think about our big matrices. Um, and uh, we can see that the, the entries of these two guys are um well are somehow given as product dot products between over, over the different xn's between um the different observables uh and so somehow if our xn's here approximates um you know a sample from some measure mu as we take the number of points to infinity the the strong law of large numbers gives us that this here should converge to some continuum approximation okay we're going to do h that there'll be some continuum approximation. Um, and uh, well, okay, we just need to establish how fast this converges to this. And um, well, assuming that these are nice enough, um, then what what actually needs to be nice enough depends on the um, depends on the function, but. Um, we can see that, well, we, we can show that the, the the error here should be, if we have randomly sampled our XNs, that should be central limit theorem style. Um, so somehow this, this is actually, this is the expectation of this as well as being the limiting process. I mean, that's how the strong law of large numbers works. Uh, if we take, if we're taking, so for example, if we're doing doing this kind of, you know, cl classical kind of EDMD thing where you take, um, you take this from a time, XN being a time series, a chaotic time series, then, with the central limit theorem, we also ex well if 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 this if if these xn's have a central limit theorem, then we expect the convergence to this where if this where the, the the integral with respect to the um 
uh, the physical measure, we expect that this convergence should be um, order one and root n. Uh, if we sort of evenly space our points um, instead, like I was like I was doing for that uh, Ulam's method example before, um, uh, then uh, we have order one on n. This is somehow like a trapezoid. It's a trapezoidal rule. Um, you know, a sort of you know one of these very low order quadrature rules. You, you can sort of show that. At least, maybe at least when this is this is at least C one. Um, maybe when it is B V. I don't know if anyone remembers. Um, and well, okay. So somehow, if we have if we have special choices of well, sort of particularly nice choices of X N and mu, as we saw for Julia, I would as, as Julia showed us, you can actually get perhaps much better, like maybe even exponential in N. Um, but I mean, these are kind of special cases. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, I yeah, I should say that we don't always use these XNs. Sometimes we just compute, we just start with these integrals. Um, I think as Stefano does, maybe. Um, uh, but yeah, um, uh, yes, yeah. You know, when we have points, we do have this. We do need to do this. Um, so uh, yes. Okay, so then then we can say okay, well, well these G and A, these G and H's, which are Koopman operator, is a Koopman matrix, um, is is composed of um, well, okay, somehow we these are going to as 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 a number of points go to infinity, these converge to some infinite dimensional matrix, uh, some you know limiting matrices. Uh, these this guy here should be invertible, otherwise, you've well, I mean, if it's not invertible, then some of your basis functions are not independent. Um, so. Let's just assume that they are. You've sort of cut you've cut down your basis functions, the ones that are all independent. And okay, well, somehow we know by perturbation that if we make a small perturbation that of G, um, so if this G infinity, so this 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 finite finite data thing is a small perturbation of that because the entries are close. Um, uh, well, somehow this is going to be a small perturbation of G infinity inverse times h infinity um and okay and the, and the rate of convergence is more or less going to be at least if we if we don't think about k in any way the rate of convergence is going to be order one on, well one on root n for random data and one on n for quadrature data and super nice for um carefully chosen um ones uh and again i mean it sort of doesn't really matter because this is this is a k by k matrix and all norms are equivalent uh, so this is this is an argument that is sort of advanced to say, well, we get at least convergence to a continuum limit. Um, but we should actually be we actually be a little bit careful here because if we try and say if we keep our let 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 let's say that we have some value of n, and so in this case we have n is ten to the fourth, and I think I chose some random data for this. This is for this this doubling I've always kind of perturbation of the doubling map example. So I mean you've seen you've seen this spectrum a lot before. Um, uh, if we do this and we, so we somehow with this n, to n equals 10 to the 4, we expect our error is 1 on is one on the square root of 10 to the 4, which is about 0 0.01. Um, okay, well, maybe it's 0 0.01 times something. So we have this error here. Uh, but we see that as, uh, as we increase the number of points k, um, something starts to go wrong for us in the sort of center of the operator, um, which already we weren't getting very very good answers, but as we increase this, you can see that something terrible is happening. And even though, you know, theoretically we're, we're like in trying to increase the accuracy of our operator because we're adding more basis functions, which could hopefully capture the infinite dimensional operator better, um, this is becoming, we're not adding more data. So this is actually becoming ill posed uh, or more more not ill posed but like sort of you know unstable and so eventually oh and you should say me show me 500 um it is only showing us 200 for some reason but um perhaps if we wait for a second this is the problem i mean again this is the problem you don't see the um you just try and run it again oh here we go right you see actually that this this eigenvalue is i mean we're seeing something we we you know this eigenvalue is completely wrong. And so if we wanted to say, oh, if we were looking, we'd say, well, there's an almost invariant set here because we have an eigenvalue close to the unit circle, but there absolutely isn't. It's 
Um, yeah. Uh, so somehow um, you you need to be careful about um, if 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 you do do this, you and and your your argument you're, and you and you're using say random data, then you need to um, be careful uh, about how many basis functions you use. Um, essentially, essentially because you're introducing um, like you, there's just a lot more sources of randomness. Like your matrix gets bigger, and so perhaps more opposed and perhaps there's more sort of coefficients that you have to include in your error terms. But um, I think actually um, this is, if you think of this, uh, this is actually something that's connected to the, um, the, theory, the theory of it in a kind of really pleasant way, uh, which is that random noise, if, if you want to in inspect the um, smaller parts of the spectrum, uh, the parts of the spectrum close to, close to zero, um, you have to look in higher order Banach spaces, say like CR rather than C1 or something like this, because as Calangelo told us, the essential spec, you know, to sort of see, see the true eigenvalues that are not being masked by the essential spectrum, you need to make your essential spectrum smaller than the eigenvalues you're interested in. Um, and so then you need to look at a higher regularity space. But when you work with random, um, uh, random points, um, we, you know, with sort of random data, somehow they play kind of worse. They play around worse in these CR spaces. Um, yeah, they they the sort of um, if you think if you think about I don't know approximating you know the five hundredth Chebyshev polynomial, which is something very wiggly using a um, data like this, it doesn't work so well. Um, no one's really investigated this um, rigorously, but I think it would be an interesting thing to do. Um, uh, yes. I think it's also kind of, I mean, I think you could, it's also kind of cute that you see these patterns here um, for this kind of discretization. I don't understand why they are. If anyone else understands why they are, that would, does anyone understand why you get this kind of, I mean, they're, they're just complete garbage. They don't mean anything. It's just, there's some random sampling and like, yeah, it's just giving you this for your transfer operator. Um, anyway, sort of cute things to question. Um, uh, but yes, anyway, in some case, I, I think I think this is, let's say this is a conjecture um, that if you have a smaller eigenvalue, uh, then if, you're, if your eigenvalue is smaller, it depends on, uh, so this is somehow like some eigenvalue, we're computing it and we're using an endpoints in K. Okay, n random points and k modes, and we can see that we get some kind of error like this. I don't know, and the error depends on k. Um, yeah, I don't know. So um, okay, so that somehow this convergence in n in our data point, but we also want to think about what happens as we have when we've got gone like just taken looked at this limit, and we're in this kind of continuum uh, behavior. This kind of continuum approximation. I think you saw that, for example, with Julia, uh, where she she with it, with her pr proof of EDMD, where she took her data points to infinity and then looked at the um, this kind of error, uh, the remaining error, and you can see here that um, well, okay, somehow we have the problem that we're trying to relate. Diff we can't just say well everything's you know everything's just a matrix. Now we actually need to relate different matrices um, of different sizes. So uh, or you know, corresponding to larger and larger dictionaries of observables, larger and larger bases uh, for uh, Cooper matrix. Uh, and we can say, well, okay, because we can sort of re sort of semi-conjugate our Cooper matrix here into the phase space, into, so into the space of functions uh, using, well, the fact that somehow if, if these guys are now, let's say linear maps from coefficient space into the, the function space, so, um, so I'm I'm really abusing notation here, and I apologize. Um, Roberto has said that we have to preserve this. So, okay, 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 okay. We'll we'll do the thing where you just rub out a bit of stuff, and uh, <laughs> or not. I don't know. Um, so, um, how would you say? Um, right. So so now we're saying that psi naught of some vector.
is the sum of AK times psi K. Um, so when I wrote this slide, when I wrote this talk, I probably should have thought a bit more carefully about what that is, but um, about the fact that there's, we're talking about matrices, but then we're talking about these kinds of linear operators uh, into functions. Uh, so uh, under psi naught, we can actually conjugate this, this matrix to um, this guy. So this is our Koopman operator times um, this matrix here, which is we'll call which is the orthogonal projection in whatever our basis is in this basis here. Um, uh, yes, onto the span of all these basis functions, uh, and you can perhaps you can just check for yourselves that this is in fact a projection. So if you take the square of it, you get now p squared is equal to p, um, and somehow then okay to understand the convergence of our Koopman matrix, which looks like this is sort of represented by this in the function space, we just need to think about how this converges to the true Koopman operator. Uh, and of course, I mean, this is, this orthogonal projection in this L squared mu is going to be, uh, you know, self-adjoint. And so if we think of our transfer, if we decide that our transfer operator is the adjoint of the Koopman operator uh, in this L squared mu space, then somehow we are uh, studying the Koopman operator is the convergence of the Koopman operator is the same thing as studying the convergence of the transfer operator. Um, okay. And uh, well, I mean, somehow actually this is not easy. Um, uh, because, well, I mean, okay, so if we say we want to study what L looks like in L squared mu, generally it is, I mean, as it's like, it's, it's kind of like the picture that we get for L, for L1, um, in the sense that, you know, often you have this, say for, for uniform expanding maps, you have this, uh, continuous spectrum, um, and, uh, that's at least where, say, where mu is Lebesgue, and that's kind of, uh, well, that's kind of useless. I mean, you, we see, we obviously see that we get eigenvalues there. We're not converging to some kind of continuous spectrum on, on the unit circle. Uh, so, well, what we need to do is um, to actually study this is to find some Banach spaces um, that either, I suppose, have a Lusoda in York inequality. So you can use um, Michele Liverani, um, which is a very sort of classic uh, way of approximating of like looking at the, the sort of stability of numerical approximations where you have a, um, where you have, you know, this kind of Lusota York inequality uh, behavior. Um, and so, and so there in that case, you can say, well, outside the essential spectrum, um, we can get, uh, you, you, you can get eigenvalues and eigenvectors and anything to do with the spectrum that kind of comes out of the spectrum to converge um, in the weak space uh, at perhaps some rate that you can, you can, you can write down. Um, perhaps if you are very lucky and you have that L is in fact compact in one of these Banach spaces, like we saw yesterday, um, uh, again, in Julia's talk, um, then, well, I mean, you can just somehow use the fact that perhaps your projection is a norm perturbation and it's very easy, but I mean, that's super unusual. You usually have to go through this. Um, there is a bit of an extra problem though, uh, that you need that, that, that in addition to having say, so the York inequality, which of course for most most chaotic maps, like we're just so far off having. Um, uh, we also need to see that it plays nicely um, with this projection. And um, so usually for for say like Owens method or for, for anything like this, we this projection here is actually, well, mu say is Lebesgue and our dictionary of functions is something that we kind of, you know, know quite a lot about. And we, you, you, you know, somehow you can show that this, um, We'll say like that this 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 is small going from a strong to a weak space. You actually also need to show that your project for the for Keller Liverani, you also need to show that your projected operator is also a basal or soda York inequality. Um usually. Um unless you're um you sort of get like you have some some trick up your sleeve. Um and this is this is well, I mean, for nice projections, for nice mu, this is kind of natural, but if mu is if mu is not Lebesgue, if for, which is actually a very standard thing to have because you have um, uh, your row. So, you, you know, if, if you're sampling from some dynamics, 
then mu is going to be your invariant measure, which is usually not Lebesgue. Uh, then perhaps I, I I think that's something that mostly has not been has has not really been understood. Um, but yeah, somehow in general, I, I, perhaps the sort of a uh, takeaway from this is that in general, like we have no idea how to do this. If an engineer gives you, he's like, here's a, here, or, you know, even a, you know, a sort of physicist or a geophysicist or something gives you a problem and is like, I have EDMD and I would like to prove this. Um, <laughs> or, you know, I, I'm using any transfer operator method, like whatever. And like, we want to prove it. Like we just don't know. We sort of have to kind of take it on trust and there's, or use some kind of heuristic argument for why this is. And often what people like the heuristic argument that sort of is used uh, by these sort of scientists and so on is that um, that our function our function dictionary is kind of almost closed under the um, uh, under the action of the Koopman operator, uh, and this is this is actually very not true for chaotic systems. Um, so somehow that's a because I mean say I mean imagine like for our, for our uniformly expanding map uh, right back at the beginning. Um, I do like that you can just slide across um this guy um when we took when we took the um well let's say we took the doubling map the ones where it worked um this guy when we took the doubling map we could see that um that is not it Thank you. Uh, we can see here that um, you know this is this is absolutely not in the space of linear functions. Um, but even if we even if we use you know a huge set of polynomials or um, perhaps even a huge set of characteristic functions, we find that this would not really be in the span of of that. In the case of characteristic functions, because your your characteristic function gets narrower. Um, so somehow, yeah, even this this argument that people have that you know sort of the space of, I suppose I should just write it down, that K of the span of, of the basis functions is approximately the span of the basis functions is just, it's just not correct, but somehow we still get nice results. Um, so I think that's, um, there's perhaps, there's many interesting questions uh, about this convergence and why it works. Um, uh, and well, I mean, I, sh I should just uh, perhaps um, give a. Uh, what are you doing there? Whatever, whatever. Okay, so <laughs> I give a little a a, a small uh, contribution to this. So we've seen Julia. Julia has talked about where you have um, some. You're on a circle map, so this is an analytic circle map. Uh, you have a polynomial basis. Um, and mu has sort of Lebesgue densities. Your, your points are sampled from Lebesgue measure. In fact, they're uniform for, uh, they're sort of evenly spaced for Julia. Um, uh, you can actually, and then you get some kind of exponential convergence of your, well, I mean, so this is the, um, the your sort of transpose of your Koopman operator. Um, and then that says, well, the, the matrix data converge exponentially fast in your number of points. Uh, you can actually extend it uh, if you sort of try and understand orthogonal polynomials with respect to this density. You can actually extend it to more general ones. Um, yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, it's 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 very much the same setting. Why is this minus? Because. Is that not because that's that this this is somehow the projection error going from the strong space to the weak space? Oh, uh, what is the weak is space? Not? Sorry, what's so the, the, the weak space? So the weak space would be so. So this is the weak space a r a little r. I mean, this is a problem. A but a big r is the strong space. So in my talk, it was r divided by r, which is would be the. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah, sorry. That should, yeah. No. 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 You're right. You're right. That should be r divided by r. Sorry. I'm, I think I was thinking of the complex strip. Yeah, there we go. All right. And that the other way R, around. And that should be R bigger than one. Oh my God, really? But okay. Wait, oh no, because it's, okay, right. Sorry, because it's R on R to the power of K. Power of minus K, I suppose. 
Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. So uh, somehow they're there. In this case, we actually see that the uh, matrix starter converts exponentially fast with k, which is probably what you want, given that we've seen that we don't want to make k too big if we're using sort of kind of say random data, um, or even really any kind of data. Uh, we don't make we don't want to make it uh, say have basis functions that we can't resolve properly. Uh, of course, this is in the uniformly hyperbolic setting, so perhaps we want to think. I mean, if we're looking at stuff that's non hyperbolic, uh, we probably don't expect this kind of convergence. Uh, although with polynomials, we might hope that this is kind of I mean somehow, especially with Chebyshev uh, polynomials, knowing that this is kind of the optimal set of approximate approximating functions. Uh, we might hope that uh, somehow we can get the best possible convergence with these sort of dynamic, well, with these kinds of Galerkin methods. Um, and I mean, again, I think this is something uh, interesting and that might be uh, sort of help uh, explain uh, things to engineers. Um, but perhaps also to uh, mathematicians, uh, it suggests that if you want to understand, I mean, at least have a go at looking at eigenvalues, maybe you should could try using some sort of transfer operator method along these lines. Um, and I should finish. I think this is the end of the talk. So thank you um, for listening. And... Questions? What about other equilibrium measures? So, uh, yes, uh, you can. As in like for the measure or for the, like for this guy or for just trying to find them? Well, I don't actually know how to pose the question well, but what if you wanted to, to have some potential and, and you yes. wanted to approximate coupon operator or transfer operator or whatever? Yes. Um, so then, so then if you wanted to access, I mean, you wanted to get at some potential, uh, you would simply, um, well, you would simply, uh, well, okay. You would change. You would change your um. Uh, you would multiply your operator by some weight, um. And um. This would uh this would hopefully allow you to access it. So, um, so so generally, say say if we if we want to, I mean as we've seen, uh we have so we want to find some Gibbs measure of potential phi. This um is you know you can write it as a left eigenvalue times a right eigenvalue um where and these these you know this is this is the left eigenvalue vector and this is the right eigenvector at the leading level of some transfer operator um what's a, what's a, what's a, what's a, what's a letter w is um some 5w no e to 5w isn't it um w composed with uh, sort of say f, f of x equals y so y equals x of w of y okay so um if you wanted to um so somehow this is this is this is like saying um oh, okay right sorry sorry to the zoom people um okay yes so <laughs> So we have this kind of expression here, and we can we can think of we can sort of write this guy say as e to the phi of y on f dash of so times f dash of y times one on f dash of y, and maybe put the one on f dash of y here. And when you do that, you see that this is the same as saying l with respect to the usual one on f dash, which is the one that you'll see. Say if you if you're using doing this with mu being Lebesgue uh, times e to the phi e to the phi times f dash times w of x. So you more or less what you do is you take your your transfer operator or in the adjoint sense your Koopman operator and you try and um, approximate this uh, and then you should I mean I. I've never tried this, but well, I mean, I've tried this for say the Chebyshev Lagrange methods certainly. Um, and then what you do, what you do is you 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 get out, you get these out numerical estimates of these out, and um, as sort of left and right eigenvalues of 
of your, you know, your transfer operator matrix or of your sort of by adjointness, your Koopman matrix. Um, at least when, at least when you're the sort of measure you're doing your uh, Galochian approximation with is Lebesgue, um, and then you should get that something meaningful. I suppose it's an open question, really, what it means if you're doing it with respect to your Galochian approximation with respect to a measure that is not uh, absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue. Say, if you had, if it was a physical measure, for example. Um, If it's not absolutely continuous, well, yes. I mean, well, we we, we can know theoretically. I mean, if I if I sample if I study in if I study like an Anisov system and I get a physical measure and then I try and you know I do my Koopman operator with respect to this physical measure, or I compute a transfer operator with respect you know projecting my basis functions using this physical using the physical measure as my measure of orthogonality. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> we don't. Um, because it, because I mean, somehow, yeah. How would you say? Because somehow, I mean, if you, if at least, at least, sort of, um, in theory, if you uh, take at least formally, let's say we take a Koopman operator with respect to, um, with respect to, say, the physical measure of a, um, uh, an invertible transformation. Um, this is like, well, this is phi times psi composed with f d rho. And this is by the invariance of rho, we can say this is phi composed with f inverse times psi d rho. And this here is, I mean, it looks it looks kind of min, it looks kind of min, you know, whatever. Uh, this is just the derivative or this is just the transfer operator, sum of f of x, f of y equals x of y. Yeah, this is duality, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is not. Um, this is not the, um, uh, how would you say, this is not the, this is not the same transfer operator as the transfer operator you get with respect to Lebesgue. Um, um, but you don't, exactly, you don't have the Jacobian in there. Um, but at the same time, like, you know, perhaps you, maybe you want to, you know, maybe you think about the spectral properties of this, but, um, You, you're sort of dealing with distributions and so this is this is true perhaps almost there so you know this this is kind of defined almost everywhere with respect to rho uh, and usually when we study when you know people do the um uh you know define these anisotropic banning spaces or whatever it, I, as i understand it it has some kind of almost everywhere behavior with respect to the bag so i mean i don't know if anyone knows the answer to this um here or anywhere um uh yeah so, like in the srb measure for a hyperbolic system that you project uh, that your measure is smooth along some particular directions yes so but you don't know on the other directions maybe uh yeah so that's basically the problem it is, it is it is a problem i mean I, I suppose if you're trying to do transfer operator stuff at least let's say with the bag you know that you have well somehow if your if your functions are nice enough i mean i think maybe there maybe there's questions for functions uh, actually I, I don't think anyone's really proven that you have that your say any of these galoka methods actually converge in anisov spaces um uh but um, you know, in that in that case, you would expect that this would be a um, uh, that this would be say this would be smooth in unstable directions, that this would be smooth in stable directions. So when you multiply them together, it's something that's neither smooth and stable nor unstable, but it makes sense to multiply them together. It's another nice open problem. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Yeah. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank Caroline again.